You know, the Bible says the bride has made herself ready. We've got to have oil in our lamps and ready for that moment in time. And so we're talking about what is required of us in these end times, what is coming, and uh, what will be happening upon the earth, and how we need to respond to that. Now, one of the most important psalms relating to the end times is Psalm 91. It is a psalm that is, spans thousands of years, and it is dedicated really for this generation. And so if you have your Bibles, if you could um, get ready, get them out, and we're going to read from Psalm 91. It is a, a very prophetic psalm, and uh, it talks about how we should prepare what is required of us in order to survive these end times which are coming on the earth. So Psalm 91 reads like this, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay, I will say unto the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. And he goes on to say this, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence, and he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will trust. His truth shall be a shield and a buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, or for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. And so he's talking about a lot of things coming upon the face of the earth. He shall cover you during this time, the arrow that flieth by night. You know, they did not have any concept of missiles when Do David wrote, wrote this. But it's talking about this generation. And then it goes on to say, you'll be alive and you'll see a thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see what the reward of the wicked. This is because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. So there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, lest thou and they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion, the adder, the young lion, the dragon, thou shalt trample under feet, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him, I will set him on high, and because he hath known my name, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him, and with long life will I sat satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is a very interesting psalm. And there's a lot in this psalm that we really, really need to understand. And it talks about conditions in the earth in the end times, and how that we will see it with our eyes, but if we are living in a place with the Lord, it shall not come near you. It talks about plagues covering the earth, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you see these things. But the key words are, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall be covered, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He will serve the Lord. He is my refuge. He is my strength. You know, the secret place, of the Most High. What is this place? What is this mysterious place called the secret place of the Most High? And so we're going to look at that today. You know, <clears throat> in the tabernacle of Moses, there was a secret place which only the high priest could enter once a year. The secret place. It was called the holiest of all. And there was no natural light in that place only the Shekinah glory lit up that compartment. It was completely out of bounds to the general public. Only the high priest could go in there once a year. It was the smallest compartment in that whole tabernacle. Yet it, it was the most dynamic. It was a place of the manifest presence of God. 
Now, the outer court of the tabernacle was a much larger place. It had no covering. That's important to understand. There was no covering in the outer court. It was open to the elements, and uh, it was a very large place. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Then the next place in was called the holy place. This had some covering, the holy place, where the candlestick was and the the showbread and the altar of incense. And so we have another compartment in there. But the holiest of all was behind the veil, completely shut off from the rest. So the secret place of the Most High is represented in the tabernacle of Moses as the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And, uh, you know, it is interesting that this the tabernacle of Moses was a picture of the layout of heaven. The Bible tells us, you know, in Exodus 25 and verse 9, it says, according to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so you shall make it. So Moses was shown a pattern which he had to build this earthly tabernacle which represented a heavenly pattern. And so we have in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, Who serve unto us as an example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, he saith he, thou shalt make all things according to the pattern shown you in, mount, in the mount. It was a shadow, the Bible says, or a picture of heavenly things. It's very, very interesting. This pattern, this threefold compartment pattern, is a universal thing. <coughs> you know, hell, the, the, the place of hell, is structured after the form of a man, Satan. And uh, the pattern, the layout, is in the shape of a man. Heaven is the same. It has an outer court, it has a holy place, it has a place called the the holiest of all, where the throne of God is. The outer court in heaven was paradise, extremely large place. The holy, pla the holy place was the inner court. It was smaller. And um, the holiest of all was the smallest area in heaven. Now, three different places there, three different levels of glory and power and, and relationship. The the whole of the universe has the same pattern. Now, it's, it's very, very interesting because the Lord said, Do not I fill heaven and earth? In, in, in Jeremiah 23 and verse 24, it says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I will not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth? You know, I, I had a... a, a a prophetic encounter some time ago where I found myself standing on a seashore and just looking up at the stars, and I wasn't sure where I was. And I felt the Lord, heard the Lord say to me, come, and as fast as you can imagine, I was taken out into the universe, but beyond the universe, so I was looking back on the universe. And I could see the whole entire universe from far over outside of the universe. And to my amazement, it was in the shape of a man. And I, as I, I looked at this, I thought, Lord. See, God said, do not I fill heaven and the earth. And the universe was in the shape of a man. And it was contained, the whole universe was contained within the Lord Jesus. You know, it's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Ephesians 1.22, it says, and, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head of, over all things to the church, which his body, the fullness of him that filleth all things. And again, we have in Colossians 1.16 and 17, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and in the earth, the visible world and the in invisible world, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, 
all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things continue to exist. You see, everything is in him. And so it's really important to understand this. You see, if you die today, the level of your walk with the Lord, the level of your relationship with the Lord, uh, determines where you will end up in heaven. You can be in the outer court, you can be in the holy place, if it, as it were, you can be in the holiest of all. And uh, there are doorways. You see, there are doorways into the heavenly realm. And the uh, first doorway, the first entrance is into paradise. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge area, paradise. There are m millions of people live in paradise. There are huge areas of paradise uninhabited. It is a huge place. It is a beautiful place, huge place. The sky, the surroundings, the grass, the water, it, it is incredible. It can't be described. But then you can move through paradise within, this, within the walls of the city. And that's a different place again. Inside the walls of the city, you see, you can go through to that place. And it's closer to the throne of God. It has more glory than the outer court of paradise. And uh, the colors are different. The sky colors is intense. And uh, then there is another place, another door to the holiest of all, the throne room of God, which is impossible to describe in your own native language. You know? So the place where you are living now, if you died today, determines your entrance into that place. And it's interesting, you see, that there are different levels in each, in each level in heaven, but where you are in your relationship with the Lord. Now listen to me, it's not what you have done for the Lord, it's your relationship. It's not how much work you've worked for him, it's your relationship, how much you've been conformed to his image that determines your place in the heavenly realm. Your physical body, we as human beings, are also patterned after the same pattern. You have a body, an outer court. You know, that's the largest area that you see. You have a soul, mind, emotions, and will, your brain, and all of these areas. You have a soul. It's, then you have a spirit. You have an outer court, a holy place the holiest of all. And, you know, body is the largest area. Then there's the soul and your spirit. Now, you'll see this dynamic every, in everything, everywhere. In the cells of your body, there are le three levels. In the universe, there are three levels. In nature, there are three levels. This pa is patterned through the whole of the universe. You'll see this dynamic in everything. You know, but you have an inner <laughs> sanctum, as it were. An inner sanctum, a secret place. Just as there was a secret place in the tabernacle of Moses, small compartment, wasn't available to the average person. General population could not go there. But you have, and within you, you have an outer court, your body, you have a holy place, your soul, but you have a secret place, the inner man. And uh, an inner sanctum where you can commune with the Lord. To survive what is coming, you have to learn to live with constant access to that inner realm. Now, access to this inner place, this secret place within us, access to that is a matter of faith and awareness. Faith and awareness. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow or the covering of the Almighty. That word, you know, dwelleth means to remain. And that word abide means permanently. That word shadow, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, is a Hebrew word which has a meaning of an opaque 
covering. Now, remember when the angel came to Mary in, in, in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, And the angel answered her and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Okay. It says, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power, the power of the highest shall overshadow you. That word, overshadow, is an interesting Greek word. It, it's ipski. <laughs> the word is ipski, and it simply means to envelop in a haze of brilliance. Literally, that's what it means. It's a very interesting word in, in, in the Greek language. And so, you know the angel is saying, and the angel answered her and said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall cover you with a haze of brilliance, light. Therefore the holy thing shall, that shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Now, very, very interesting. The word covering. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall say, The Lord is my covering. You see? In Acts chapter 5 and verse 15, there's an interesting passage of Scripture about Peter. It says, Inasmuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by, might overshadow some of them. The word here is the word skia, comes from the, the word we were talking about with Mary. But you see, it wasn't a natural shadow. Otherwise, if there was no sun out, there would be no shadow, and people wouldn't get healed. That was not the case. But there was something else that was only visible in the realm of the Spirit, that if people walked through it, they would be healed. You see, at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow them. You've got that word again. And they were healed. This covering, you see, this overshadowing, this covering can be over a person. It can be over an entire house. It can be over an entire church. You know? It's, it's it's very very interesting because I was part of a re, of a revival in the 1970s and the church that I was in there was a specific covering over it in those days. We were in the middle of revival and um, any unsaved person who crossed the line entering the church did not come out the same. Virtually nearly always they were born again. They came out born again. And uh, there was an invisible, as it were, force field, the presence of God, a, a brilliant haze that overshadowed. And uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, a brilliant haze of light. You know, nothing can penetrate it. No germ can penetrate it. No plague can penetrate it. Nuclear radiation cannot penetrate it. Plagues can't get through. It will cover you. Only with your eyes shall you see these things happening in the earth. I will say unto the Lord, He is my refuge, my God. He shall cover you with his feathers. You know, it was an incident in the church that I was pastoring at that time. And I was preaching and a man came. He was what they call a bikey. He was covered in tattoos. He had a can of beer in his hand and he was partially drunk and he's just swaying in the doorway of the church listening to me preach and looking at me. And I was preaching away then. I thought, Lord, just let him step over that line. And he just stayed there and he was kind of swaying, listening, and he made one step over. That was it. He fell flat on his face. I went on preaching. The service ended. There were some people around. I came back. To where he was and I could hear him saying something he was lying still on his face so I knelt down to listen to what he was saying he was speaking in tongues he'd been born again he had an encounter with the Lord he was born again baptized in the spirit you see that shadowing passing that covering entering that covering 
you know, there is a covering that we have which is external, you see, but we also have something internal. Christ is in us and we are in Christ. And that concept is, it can be a little confusing, you know. How can Christ be in you and you in him? Well, um, say I had a, a, a container of water here, and I took a glass, so just an ordinary tumbler glass, and put it in the water so it sank to the bottom. Now, is the water in the glass, or is the glass in the water? It's both. You see, and that's how it is. We're in Christ, and Christ, you know, is in, in, in us. Jesus fills the whole universe, and the universe is in him. We are in him, and he is in us. So, how do we dwell in the secret place of the Most High? That secret place is our spirit. So, how do we live there? How do we connect with that? First, your spirit is spirit. It's not of this world. It lives in another dimension. It exists in another dimension. It is invisible to the natural eye. I'm talking about your own human spirit now, which is inside you. Invisible to the natural eye. Doesn't live with the limitations of time and space as we know it. It has a full set of senses. It can see, hear, taste, touch, smell, has emotion, feel, you know. So you have another you, you see, living almost like in a parallel world right inside of you. Now, it's inside. Your spirit is inside of you. And it's keeping you alive. It's the power source that powers your brain, the cells in your body. It keeps you alive. You know, in James chapter 2 and verse 26, it says, For the body without your spirit is dead. When you die, your spirit comes out of your body and the power source is left. Your body just dies. You see? So there are two of you. Now that's a frightening thought, isn't it? There are two of you. There's the external you, which is your soul and your physical body, uh, physical body which contains the soul, and there's your inner you, the inner man. In 1 Corinthians 6.17 it says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So when you're born again, there's a permanent connection with your spirit and the Lord. The problem is we are not aware of that. It's a reality, but it doesn't come through to here because this is in another realm. You know, the Bible tells us it's the truth that sets you free. Understanding the ways of God, understanding truth can set you free. Your spirit has a permanent connection with the Lord. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, so there's a permanent connection. You see, when you are born again by the Spirit of God, the Bible says you are born of the seed of God. The seed enters your spirit. Being born again, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So, when you are born again, you receive the seed. That is the nature of God. That's who he is, that's what he is like. You are a son, an heir, a son, a child of God. You are a new species, a new creation. Okay? But it is the nature, when you're born again, you receive the seed, the nature of God. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you receive the ability of God. You need the ability as well as the nature. So the two are very, very important. The nature of God basically can be summed up as one thing. God is love. The nature of God. But you see, it is very, very frustrating if you love somebody but you can't help them. You need the ability of God to help them. You need the gifts of the Spirit to help them. You see, you need gifts 
to express love. If you seek love, you will be given power or gifts to love with. The gifts of the Spirit are currently operating at a very, very low level, but the day is coming when the fullness of those gifts will come into operation. And that has to do with whether the fullness of the love of God is abiding within us. Now, the seed of God, that seed comes within us, but it has to grow. The nature of God has to grow within us. The seed of God has to grow. Now, let me just say something to you which might take a little to understand. But your spirit never had never read the Bible, the Word of God. Your spirit had never read the Bible, the Word of God, until you read it. You see, the Bible just came into existence in, in a written form in the early church, and it was, you know, most in the early church did not have a, a New Testament at all. They just had the Old Testament. They didn't have a New Testament. Yet they moved in power and ability and grace, you know, in a wonderful way with just the Old Testament. After a, a quite a long time, then the letters of Paul and some of the gospel writers, a few Christians had access to that, but most of them didn't. So we need to understand that kind of setting. And so the Bible, as we know, came into existence slowly from the early church on through. But, and there is a Bi there is Bible in heaven. But you see, Jesus is the Word. And the Word was made flesh, and the Word then came to us in written form. And it was not in written form in heaven at all. Your spirit needs you to read the Word. really important you understand this because your spirit has to grow and it grows a lot faster than you your soul your natural mind comprehension of it you see your spirit did had not read the word the bible until you read it jesus is the word in heaven you see your spirit craves the word of god your spirit craves the scripture first corinthians 2 10 but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but by the Spirit of God. In other words, you know, you only know as much about God as your Spirit does. Let that sink and your spirit has access to it through you, the, the Bible, through you. Now, the natural mind cannot know the things of God. It needs your spirit first to understand, and it needs your spirit then to convey that to you, the outer man. And the stronger, the more mature the inner man is, the more that the inner man directly impinges upon the outer man. So, the secret place of the Most High is your inner sanctum, the inner man, which has continuous and direct connection with the Lord. It's one spirit. So, how do you connect with that, and how do you dwell there? Because if we don't, we're not going to survive what's coming. So, we have to learn to have a connection, an outer connection, as well as an inner connection with the Lord. So, the secret place of the Most High, he that dwelleth there shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So, now initially, it's a matter of faith and awareness. I want you to get something I'm about to say, and I need you to meditate on it and pray about it. And bit. I'm going to share something with you. It's this, only what you you are aware of is real to you. Let's say it again. Only what you are aware of is real to you. All right, you're aware of your car you drive. You're, it's real to you. You're aware of your house. It's real to you. But only what you are aware of is real to you. 
This is not just a law that operates in our physical realm. It is a law that operates in the spiritual realm. And it's important you understand this. For Jesus to be real to you in the level we're talking about, you have to be aware some way of his presence. Awareness is very important. You know, King David was a man that walked with God, and the Bible says he had a heart after God, as a God. You know, he spent much of his time in the presence of God until he finally learned how to constantly be aware of the Lord. In Psalm 16 and verse 8, David said this, and this, this verse is important enough to be repeated in the New Testament. Psalm 8, 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now, David was aware that the Lord was always with him. He knew that. But to be aware of it was another time. But he said, I've learned to set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. David learned and developed spiritual awareness. This verse is very important. It's, it's repeated in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2 and verse 25, where it says, For David spoke concerning the Lord. He said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, because I knew he was at my right hand. He knew the Lord was always with him. Therefore, he developed awareness of him. And he said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. David was very unique in the Old Testament. He, he, he broke through, you know, and experienced things that, f that, that few in the Old Testament did. He broke through the dispensations. And, uh, you know, in his ta the David's tabernacle, he, he would sit there for hours and watch the Ark of the Covenant and the light coming from it. That was a big no-no in the, in the Old Testament. Only the high priest could go in there once a year. But he, he has it in an open tent. You know, very unique. And he did quite a number of things that were unique um, for the Old Testament. And he de developed an awareness of the Lord. He saw the Lord. These are not normal occurrences in the Old Testament. He saw the Lord. You know, I love it when God messes with our theology and, and breaks out of our man-made dispensations. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not bound by our man-made dispensations, the boxes we put him in. The phrase, in spirit... <laughs> In spirit, that phrase occurs 26 times in the New Testament. That's a lot of times. Therefore, it requires some serious consideration. You know, Romans chapter 8 in verse 9, that ye are not of the flesh, but of the spirit. What does that mean? If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Again, Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Revelation 1.10, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a great voice behind me. What does it mean to be in the Spirit? See, John said, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and then, only then, did he hear that voice say, come up. So, what does it mean? How we, you see, the problem is we're told to walk in the Spirit, we're told to live in the Spirit, but we're not told how to do it. It's a bit like prophecy, you know, we're told that all may prophesy, but we're not told how to do it. These things have to be taught us of the Holy Spirit so that we can teach them to other people. 
it's often to describe difficult to describe spiritual things because we are more at home in the natural realm than the spiritual or the physical realm. We, you know, we understand the physical realm more because that's where we've lived all our lives. However, awareness plays a very big part in understanding this subject. Developing spiritual awareness requires discipline and the use of our senses. Hebrews 5.14, but strong meat belongs to those that are of full age, even who, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. See, David walked with God and he spent much time in the presence of God until he finally learned how to consistently have a connection with the Lord. In Psalm 16, and uh, verse 8, it says, I have set the Lord before me. That was something David did. Notice the word here, I, I, I have set the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, he knew he was there, but he's invisible to the natural. He said, I learned to set him before me. I learned to connect with the spiritual realm. He learned and developed spiritual awareness. This verse was really important. It's a key to how David walked with the Lord. He was quite unique in the Old Testament. He saw the Lord. He developed the ability to stay in constant connection with the Lord. Now, spiritual awareness begins with first becoming aware of your own human spirit. That's where you start, becoming aware of your own human spirit. It's important if you're going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, which is the inner place, it is your spirit on the inside, you have to develop an awareness of the you. When was the last time you were aware of your spirit, man? When was the last time you talked to your spirit, man? When was the last time you were aware of him? Come on. You have to de- if you're going to develop spiritual awareness, the first thing, you have to be aware of your own spirit. You see, after all, your spirit is the real you. And you need to know the voice of your human spirit. Your human spirit has a voice. The Holy Spirit has a voice. But your human spirit has a voice. You need to practice being aware of your spirit. Think about him. Talk to him. Imagine him with on the inside. Form a mental image of your spirit on the inside. You see, you have to develop awareness. You have to develop awareness of your spirit until you become aware of your spirit naturally without having to focus all the time, that you're aware of your spirit at all times. You will not become too aware of the spirit realm until you have first become very much aware of your own human spirit, the real you. Once you become aware of your spirit, you will be start to become aware of a wider sphere of the kingdom of God, the realm of the Spirit in the kingdom of God. You see, the doorway through that realm, into that realm, is through your spirit. You cannot go there with the natural mind. You can go there with your spirit. Your spirit does no limitations on it. It exists in the same realm. You know? Luke seventeen twenty not one. Neither say, Lord here or Lord there, but behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The Bible talks about the hidden man of the heart. First Peter three and verse beginning of verse four, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, that which is not corruptible, the hidden man of the heart. You see, somewhere within you there's a hidden man in a secret place. And that hidden man has a constant, permanent connection with the Lord. 
It's the real you. This person existed in eternity before you were born, before this world, before this world took on a physical form, before you had a physical body, your spirit existed in that realm. The hidden man of the heart. The outward man is visible to the natural eye and the natural senses. The inward man is invisible to our natural senses. The inward man does not decay, but is constantly renewing itself. 2 Corinthians 4.16 For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, our inward man is renewed day by day. There's the two men, the outward man, inward man. So, only what is real to you, only what you are aware of is real to you. Life flows from our spirit into our soul and into our body. But most of that life, there is a connection which keeps us alive. But if that connection, that life is to increase within our physical body, you know, that happens through awareness. The word life, you see, in the Bible, in, in the New Testament, Romans 8, 6, it says, the life of God, it's Zoe, it is the life of God. So, to be spiritually mindness, minded means we have an awareness of that realm. If God's life flows through your body and into your soul, and then into your body rather, flows from your spirit, the stronger your spirit is, the more life that is flowing. The more mature your spirit has become, the more life is flowing. Now, you know, when we take the Lord's Supper, we've talked about this, you know, it's, it, it talks about eating of the Lord's flesh, and it talks about the Lord's Supper, um, and that how that, you know, when we bless those emblems, we impart life, there's life imparted to the life of God, resurrection life from his resurrection body, and the power of the blood through the wine. When we partake of that, we have to have an awareness of that life, flowing into our physical body. It's not just something we do by faith. You have to have an awareness of it happening. You have to see it happening. You have to see that life flowing into the cells in your body. Only, you see, to be we, you, what you're aware of is real to you. It actually happens. Practice. You have to become aware of your spirit connected to the Lord with a permanent connection. Second Corinthians four eighteen, while we look not on things which are seen, but we look at things which are unseen. How do you do that? With awareness. When this becomes second nature to you, you'll become aware of your spirit. You see? You close your eyes and you can become aware of your house, even though you're a hundred miles away from it. You can be home, you can be standing in the garden of your house, right? You have that ability, God made us that way. Now, the same principle applies. You have to see your spirit with those same eyes, the inner eyes. You have to see your spirit. You have to see the life flowing out of your spirit into the physical body. When this becomes second nature to you, you begin to walk in the spirit. You begin to live in the spirit. But it requires diligence, persistence. David had to learn how to do this. The secret place of the Most High is living in this inner world with a connection and an awareness of the Lord and the kingdom of God. Developing that awareness puts a covering over you. Only what you are aware of is actually real. Really important. You see, many prophets and sages and godly men in the past walk with the Lord like this, but they never told us how to do it. And this has always, you know, been the problem. The Bible talks about the law of the spirit of life. What is that law? 
What is the principle? What law did he talk about? The law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. What is that law of life? It's awareness. Knowing the truth that the Lord is with us. Knowing the truth that if we are joined to the Lord in our spirit, and that's where the life flows into our physical body. The law of the spirit of life set us free. So first you must become aware of your spirit, become familiar with your spirit, talk to your spirit, become aware of it. You know, don't go through a whole day without being aware. In the end, it will be a natural thing. It will be as simple, as natural as breathing to you. You're just aware. Okay? It becomes second nature to you. You start to walk in the spirit. So drawing this now to a close, Psalm 91 is your secret place. How do you dwell there by a witness? And it takes practice, it takes perseverance, it takes prayer, it takes asking, seeking, knocking. Use your inner faculties. You see, the soul is a bridge between the two realms. And you have what is called the power of imagination. God has great imagination. He sees things before he creates them. He sees them as being in existence before he creates them. You have the ability to picture your inner man. Now it's Isaiah 26 and verse 20, drawing this to close. Isaiah 26 is a, a chapter uh, it's dealing with the end times. It says in verse 20, Come my people, enter into your chamber. And shut the doors behind thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little a moment until the indignation be overpassed. The Lord is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Okay, he's talking about the judgments of God in the end times. And it says, you know, the only safe place is to live in this realm we're talking about. And there's something about awareness that puts a covering over you. It says, come my people, enter into the secret place of the Most High, your inner chamber, shut the door, live there, hide yourself as it were for a little moment. And we have to learn how to do this. It's a key. You see, it's not what you're doing for the Lord, it's who you are. It's your relationship to the Lord that counts. The greater the relationship, the more fruit you naturally produce. And you have to learn. You are a spiritual being, and it's, you have to learn to be aware that you are a spiritual being and walk in that awareness. Let's just pray. Lord, I pray today that you'll just open the hearts and minds of your people to understand I pray, Lord, that revelation will come through the Lord, through their spirit, and to their minds and understanding through revelation, the ways of God and how to move with him and how to live in that realm. I pray, Lord, that you will release the spirit of revelation of your people so that they might see and understand. Lord, we're coming into these end times as we're living in the end times. We need to know how to walk constantly in that secret place, in that awareness of you and our spirit and the connection we have with you, and walk in two realms, the kingdom of God and as well as this earthly realm. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.